coming. Uh, this is a long time coming for uh, Basel in Miami to have a talk that focuses on issues that are integral to the Caribbean. Um, I'm going to have, we have three leading cultural figures from the region here, and I'll let everyone introduce themselves. Hello, my name is Pablo Guardiola. I'm a co-director of Meta Local, which is an arts nonprofit based in San Juan, Puerto Rico. Um, our main goal in the space is um, to promote and support artistic practices and aesthetic thought in, within our context that it's um, Puerto Rico. And we do that through three main programs. Um, we run a residency program. We also run an open non-curriculum school where, where everyone can propose a class either as, as request or resource. And then also we run a research and production program. It's a nine month program for or artists, where we work pretty much nine months with um, four to six artists. I've got my own, thank you. Hi, um, good afternoon, I'm Amanda Coulson. I'm the director of the National Art Gallery of the Bahamas, which is on the island of New Providence. Um, the gallery, which is a museum, but it's called a gallery in a very colonial way, uh, has been there since 2003, so it's a very young institution. Uh, we are committed to preserving and promoting Bahamian art, which means a two-fold um, approach. One is reaching out into the community uh, and, of course, reaching out internationally. Um, we have a permanent collection, which is on display on the ground floor. We have a project space where we do uh, rotating shows every month, so there's always something new happening. And then we do temporary exhibitions on the second floor, which last about three to four months, which are generally large-scale uh, projects or retrospectives. Um, so that's what we do. We do a lot of education in the community, uh, mural programs. We work uh, throughout the islands. We're trying to open a branch on one of the other islands. The Bahamas has the challenge of being an archipelago, so we have 700 islands and keys. Only about 20 of them are inhabited, but obviously being a national institution and being located on one island is quite a challenge. So we're trying to sort of reach out into the other communities. Um, and that's, that's us. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Verla Poupeye. I'm the executive director of the National Gallery of Jamaica. Uh, we have been in existence since 1974. We're the National Art Museum of Jamaica. Uh, we are celebrating our 40th anniversary this year, actually. Our main uh, presence is in Kingston, on the Kingston waterfront in downtown Kingston. Uh, we recently also opened uh, a branch in Montego Bay, National Gallery West. Uh, we have um, an encyclopedic collection of Jamaican art from pre-Columbian to the present uh, day, so that is on view in permanent exhibitions. And then we typically have three to four major exhibitions per year and sometimes smaller uh, exhibitions interspersed. The National Gallery in Jamaica has been, until recently, quite wedded to the idea of, of the national, of, of focusing on Jamaican art in a narrow sense. We have been widening that terrain um, by including Jamaican diaspora and increasingly also including artists from elsewhere in, um, in the Caribbean. We're just opening today our um, Jamaica Biennial, which is um, in several locations in Kingston and, um, and uh, Montego Bay at National Gallery West, uh, and that is one of our major exhibitions uh, for this year. Okay, uh, the basic idea with this talk was to not only address issues that affect uh, the Caribbean in particular, but generally issues where you've got art spaces that have dual purposes and functions. So there's a bit of a question raised as to what's your socio-economic responsibilities in addition to your art responsibilities. Um, and as people running institutions, and I know Pablo's institution is very pedagogical, he said, so running spaces in regions where you may not have as large an artistic community um, as in North America or Europe, uh, what kind of issues you find you particularly face? Maybe we can start. Um, one of the goals of our programs is to push overlaps of different practices, not necessarily artistic ones, and then also to push people doing different things within other fields. Um, that's kind of like thought, you know, kind of like thinking in the fact that a lot of the institutions in, in Puerto Rico are really slow and bureaucratic. So it's, we are kind of like providing a space, you know, thinking a lot about flexibility and, and being agile. 
to, you know, in order to have those overlaps. And kind of like that thing, you know, usually tend to other collaborations. Usually we try to push collaborations between artists and our thinkers. Um, a challenge that we face here is like we have a lot of people that are not related to the art, and then kind of like having this, um, you know, this exchange usually comes easier from the art part within the other fields, but then usually it's more complex when it's, you know, kind of like, um, you know, like people understanding what an artist do and <laughs> what is the function within society. So that's kind of like a tricky situation there. Uh, Verily, what would you be able to say maybe in Jamaica? Um, do you find that there is a bit of a difficulty with that? Are you expected to fulfill a role that you think maybe the museum should not fulfill? Uh, sure. I think the main problem that we face is that uh, we have to be everything to everybody in the artistic community and the educational community and so on. Um, there is at the present time um, a near absence of art spaces, of non-profit art spaces, even of commercial galleries also, most of which have closed down in the last uh, couple of years. So In Jamaica in particular. In, in Jamaica right. in particular. So uh, we have to be everything to everybody. And uh, we serve, uh, for instance, as, as the main space for contemporary art projects, not only because we want to, but also because we're the only place where it can be done. You know, um, I think also there is a strong sense in Jamaica that um, we have to establish our relevance. I think one of the biggest questions that has surrounded the National Gallery over the years that is that it was perceived as a very elitist um, institution which the country could not afford to support, etc., etc. And that is something that we have been working on a lot to establish our relevance to the various communities we have to uh, serve. Um, it's also one of the biggest challenges, you know, because even though our visitorship has increased uh, quite a bit over the last couple of years, it really is just a small segment of, of the population. And I would say the vast majority of Jamaicans probably do not even know where we are located, let alone what we do, you know. Amanda, do you find you have the same problems in the Bahamas? Uh, yeah, I mean, every, a lot of people know where we're located because the island's only 21 miles long. So uh, generally when I say I work at the National Art Gallery, Bohemians say, oh yeah, that, that building. And I say, have you been in? Um, and very often not. So we have the same, we have quadrupled visitorship in the last three years. But um, we have very similar problems. But as Verla said, our institution is 40 years old. Our country is only 41 years old. So we're still really at a place where the idea of going to a museum with your family is not a common um, you know, pastime. And so that's something we really have to do. And reaching out to the local community is, is something I've really been focusing on for the last three years. We're actually situated as well. And I'm sure you have this problem, and it's probably similar in a lot of um, you know, colonial nations. The building is a building that represents the colonial past. We're in a very beautiful villa from 1860. Uh, it sits on top of a hill with a beautiful view of the bay. It's where the wealthy lived. Um, down the hill to the front is the very bustling downtown. It's where all the tourists go. A lot of money is put in there. And on the other side is the area we call over the hill, which is essentially the inner city. So we are, as an institution, not only metaphorically, but very literally, a bridge between these two very different worlds. And so for us, reaching out to the community over the hill is of prime importance, and it's actually what I'm working very hard on now. So we're about to do a very large project, which we actually launched with our Basel on the Kickstarter campaign to create an outdoor space so that I can welcome the community from over the hill into the museum space. So we want to have a sculpture garden, but also an urban garden. It's the site of the first African hospital, but many, many people don't know that. So we also find ourselves in the position of having to perform a lot of educational functions that I was surprised to find we would have to do to talk about Bohemian history, to as talk about- As an art space. You mean as an art space, yeah. yeah. Um, Does this affect what you're able to show? Do you find? And this question would apply to, uh, to you, Pablo, really as well. And when you have this responsibility, do you find that there's challenging, challenging work, per se, that you might want to show that you're not able to, or you think, you know, this would be quite interesting um, on an art level, but actually it would be a little too, too racist. I, the I think you have to. I don't really worry about it. I mean, I worry about it, but I think we can't limit ourselves. I mean, we're there, we're art spaces. Uh, we're all contemporary art spaces as well as historical, at least in our case. 
Um, but I think you do have to think very carefully about what relevance does it have for the community. Um, what ways can you uh, reach out and make, make a connection so that it makes sense? Uh, and I think that's something that I always think very, very deeply about for every show. And I guess in that same vein, uh, how do you balance the relationship of working with artists that are from the local communities and the country um, that you're based in, as well with showing international art? Do you find that that's a little tricky, finding that balance? Do you find that as, for example, with Verily being the primary art space in Jamaica, that there is a need for you to show international art? All right, well, there, um, increasingly, I would say, in the contemporary Caribbean art scene, um, there's a lot of exchange. You know, it really is a network, and we cannot exclude ourselves from that. So we have to open ourselves up to that, which is uh, what we're doing at the present uh, at the present so time. International as an inter-Caribbean. Mostly, you know. Right. So that is where the, the the frontier is right now for us. Um, you know. There are all sorts of rationales for that. One is to participate in those dialogues. The other one is also simply to provide more exposure because the frame of reference about art in Jamaica is often quite narrow, you know, and there really is a need to, uh, to show that there are many, many other possibilities over and above what uh, we have been used to in, in, in the Jamaican context. So for us, it's kind of, it's, we're not that connected to what's happening outside, you know, I mean, the context of, the, of Puerto Rico, especially regarding culture institutions. So for us, it's highly important to have a dialogue between what's happening there with the international scene in a way, but also to be really honest in terms of like pushing things that are actually, you know, kind of like paying attention to the context and kind of like our practices that are thinking the context of Puerto Rico. But, um, but also, you know, like bridge, um, building bridges with, with similar organizations or similar artists in a way to kind of like, you know, people that, that let's say we share some ethos. Right. So it's, you know, like, it's, it's tricky, too, because in a way, you know, like, maybe things that are happening in the island, maybe we don't have anything to do with it. Uh, and okay. then maybe we can find, you know, like, you know, like, an easier relationship with things that are happening outside. So it's kind of like always a negotiation between both. Between the, the two. Okay. Um. I, mean, I think essentially, I looked up the word insular the other day. And the first meaning of it is actually narrow-minded, and uh, it's before being of an island. So I think we probably, I, I certainly, Verla and I have had conversations about this. To bring the international in is always a challenge because, of course, there's the feeling that like we have to promote our own. Our own right. are so underrepresented internationally. Why would you want to bring a foreigner in? Um, so it is a struggle to bring to, to create international connections because very often it's seen as. Uh, why are you putting energy into something outside? Um, why aren't you focusing on inside? Uh, so I think it's a sort of a constant balance between trying to provide for your local audience and support right. your local artists, but also to um, make everyone understand this very important thing of being connected to the outside world. Um, how do you guys balance preserving heritage and championing heritage with showing contemporary work? Because do you find, I mean, if the artists, if artists do not feel like referring to heritage in their practice, in the work they make, do you find that you have to toe the line and do both? Um, for us, not so much. I mean, as I said, our country is very young. It's 41 years old. So we're still very much struggling with actually what our culture is in terms of Bahamianness. So we're all very aware of the history of colonialism. and But what actually to be Bahamian is, is still something we're very much formulating. So it's something I'm very conscious of because I think as the leading cultural institution, we're responsible for that. We're responsible for uh, helping formulate that idea of nationhood. Um, but in terms of heritage, I mean, when there's a historical society and there's a, a museums devoted to history and slavery, um, and they sort of have the artifacts. But I think for us as a fine art museum, it's really about the language of who we are as a people and how do we express that um, artistically? Well, we are a national art museum and we have a fairly significant collection. So uh, showing that collection um, in a way that is meaningful is, is a, 
integral part of what we do and is also uh, what is expected from us. What we have started doing now with the contemporary art uh, scene is to try to bring that in dialogue with, with our collections. Uh, so for a lot of our exhibitions, we have started integrating contemporary interventions with, with selections from the collection so that it doesn't become a sort of us and them kind of situation whereby the heritage part gets put in a bubble and then the contemporary art scene is sort of seen in opposition um, uh, to it, which is what has happened since, since the 1980s in, to some extent. Uh, and we have found that that allows, that has made great benefits on both sides. It uh, shows um, unexpected continuities and, and that we had not even thought of. But then also it makes both sides of the equation more relatable. You know, um, if you can show that what an artist in the 18th century was dealing with is, 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 is related in some way to what happens today and vice versa, you know, both become more interesting. So I think that, that's really the answer to that, is to make, to make sure that you do not separate the contemporary art scene from that heritage component so that the heritage does not become objectified as this, this thing that is separate and apart from everything else. For us, it's kind of like a savage place where, as a, as a platform of exchange of knowledge, we yeah. kind of like throw everything there and, and, <laughs> and see how it works. You know, like in a way also, we, we, tr we try really hard not to have a hierarchies in terms of that knowledge. Yeah. So it's a space where, you know, like the, the academic and the artisan could be in the same level. And, but we are really, you know, we try to push things to be, you know, kind of like have readings in the present. So kind of like, you know, this idea of heritage, it's, it's more based on, you know, kind of like in being present, you know, like nowadays in Puerto Rico, not kind of like just going back and just having a nostalgic reading of something in the past, or kind of like just having a highly folkloric approach to culture. Right. So for us, it's more kind of like a place where everything could just be pushing each other and kind of like see what happened from there. I think it's about sort of making sense of history. Because when you think, for us again, it's, it's learning about what happened before, we, we, but it's really trying to make sense of it in the present, as I think that uh, is the real challenge. Um, I was very surprised to learn that in the public schools, history is taught up until 1973, when we became a nation, and then it's not. So actually, I, I really feel that for the Bahamas, it's very much the recent history that we really have to grapple with. Um, in that time of really trying to find, like, what does that mean to be independent and who are we? Um, I'm not sure where are we now for time. Um, I was wondering if you guys would maybe want to talk about connectivity between the islands and uh, the relationships between <laughs> how you may operate with each other, how you would want to work with each other in the future, uh, challenges you might face. Um, I mean, it's Within the Caribbean, you find that the French Caribbean, the Spanish Caribbean, and the English-speaking yes. Caribbean tend to be sort of three different little rivers flowing along that don't necessarily always intersect. Um, so <laughs> I don't know if you'd want to speak a bit about that, uh, how you may have tried to cross uh, to, to intersect the, the, the two different, the three different niches. And the Dutch Caribbean, actually. See? Well, from Puerto Rico, there's no connection at all. <laughs> yeah. So, Puerto Rico is not in the Caribbean. No, it's, it's not even, you know, like, there's, there's other connections, you know, like cultural collect, con connections, but in terms of, of actually things happening between the islands, it's none. And, and we would love to, you know, it's something that we think all the time. You know, even we don't, you know, like, we, we Did all... Did your audience ask for it? Yes and no. You okay. know, like, if we talk about, you know, the artists that, that worked, that we worked together in different projects, yes. Yeah. But it's kind of like also a way of, of kind of like having a, you know, kind of thinking about the different art practices and, and cultural practices, you know, within the islands. You know, like even we have, and sometimes it's even easier to do that through New York. Right, right. <laughs> but that doesn't make any sense. You know, it makes sense in a way, but, but we, we, we really would love to have more connections between, you know, what's going on in other places. Not even, you know, not even the, the Spanish-speaking Caribbean. But in general within the region. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's something we're all struggling with because we're all on our little islands and connectivity is really the big challenge, logistics and connectivity. I mean, to get around, to fly anywhere, you have to always go through Miami or New Miami. York. You know, you're constantly flying up to fly down. And as you said, the language is, we tend to, like Verla and I speak, we know each other. I speak to people in Barbados and Bermuda, not so much 
the Spanish-speaking Caribbean and the French-speaking Caribbean, even though I speak French. It's just that mm. so we do have to all try a bit harder. I need to give a shout out to the Davidoff Foundation, though, yeah. the Art Initiative, because that's been something that's really helped also bring a lot of us together and is um, trying to create more interconnectivity in the region, because it's something I think that we all feel like as a region we're quite powerful, but again, it's, it's, it's hard because we're even We're more powerful as a region than much we are more powerful individually. As a region. Yeah. yeah. Um, but even though we all share these very similar histories, we're all so extremely different. So it's, it's a definitely a challenge. I would say it's, it's improving. You know, we kind of used to all live in our own bubbles and then meet each other at exhibitions of Caribbean art somewhere right. else uh, or conferences somewhere else. Um, I think no thanks to... Um, various networks created just simply by Facebook and, and so on. I mean, if I have a question about a professional matter and I want an, uh, a second opinion, I contact a colleague in Barbados and so on. So those sort of things have become a lot easier than before. You mentioned the Davidoff Initiative. I mean, something which has also been very influential for us is ARC Magazine and, and the network they have created. Uh, because now we're, we're practically in real time what artists, definitely in the English-speaking Caribbean, but also beyond are, are doing. I think the big separation is still, I think we are in communication fairly often with, with Martinique, with, uh, with Curaçao and so on, but the big separation is still between the English-speaking Caribbean and the Spanish-speaking Caribbean. And the Caribbean. Spanish, yeah. yeah. So that's something we'll have to work on. Um, but I think the, terri the time is right to do it. You know, we are now collaborating uh, for our biennial. We have a work by Blue Curry, um, artist from the Bahamas. Um, Thank you very much for your support of that. I mean, it would not have been possible. Um, so I think we're beginning to see possibilities for regional networked events and collaborations. It will probably start in relatively small ways, probably within the English-speaking Caribbean, but it can go beyond, you know, and, um, and that is what I'm hoping for, that, that we can move out of our bubbles and interact more freely. Do you all get good support from the diaspora? And then after that, I thought we could maybe open up to any questions or comments from the people in this room, because there's a lot of people from within the diaspora in the room. But um, do you find that you get support either financially, uh, in terms of visitor numbers, from the diaspora outside the Caribbean? No? No? I think, um, so no. not, not really. <laughs> I mean, yeah, a little bit. But I think a lot of the time, certainly for the artists, and I, and I completely understand, once you sort of made it, you don't want to be um, exoticized. Right. So I think a lot of uh, Bahamians in particular, I can't speak for anyone else, that, that go abroad and, you know, you, you don't want to be put in a box of being a yeah. Caribbean artist. Or, so but they're African-American. There are many great African-American artists that are, if you dig a little deeper, sure, but, make an American. You know, believe, I don't think anyone's ever gone to the Bahamas to go to a museum. <laughs> uh, financially, not really. Um, I think there is goodwill, but I think there is not necessarily a clear structure for it to happen in or a clear understanding of what exactly is needed and how it is needed. Um, where we see the most interactions is in terms of visitorship. I mean, uh, for instance, around the holidays when typically Jamaican diaspora uh, will come to Jamaica, uh, that's when we see a, a, um, a spike in our visitorship. And a lot of that is, is um, Jamaican families who are visiting, who do the little cultural tours and, and all of that. So, so that is a part of it. But then the main change that we have seen is the artists. I mean, there are lots of artists with Jamaican connections, with Caribbean connections all over. And there is um, a lot of them are interested in exhibiting in, in the Caribbean, exhibiting at the National Gallery. So that is where things, uh, at the National Gallery in Jamaica, that is where things are changing. Where we have challenges with that is that we cannot really fund that. You know, so, right. And the expectations are for us to fund it, to fund the shipping, to fund customs and so on. Customs is a nightmare in Jamaica, you know, so anything that has to go through customs is, is very, very difficult. So there are lots of logistical problems that prevent that from happening in a way um, that would be really productive because uh, definitely Jamaican culture is not limited to the island of Jamaica. It's a much broader uh, cultural sphere and I think that holds true for the entire Caribbean. You know? In the case of Puerto Rico, since we are a US territory, so the diaspora situation is it's a whole different thing. Right. So it's, it's more about, you know, kind of like having, you know, like, I like to think about 
you know, like Puerto Rican culture also exists in, in New York and, and probably here in Florida too, where there's a high concentration of Puerto Ricans. But it's a whole different situation since, since the, the you know, let's say the flow, it's, you know, you the can... The flow is the same. Yeah. But you, so you wouldn't regard uh, them out of Puerto Rico as the diaspora. It's just still... Me? Yeah. I don't. No. Okay. Okay. Um, did anyone in the room... Yes, there's a few. We have a microphone. Um, thank you. I'd like to thank uh, each of the panelists uh, for this conversation. I think it's been too long in coming. Um, I wanted to ask Verily and uh, I'm forgetting your name, Amanda. Amanda, to say a little bit more about uh, whether or not there are educational components to the two gal galleries. Um, because it seems to me that critical conversation, dialogue about the production consumption of Caribbean art is one of the ways that the, the work will survive, but the institutions will also grow. And I, ha I just like to hear more about what, if any, programs such as that are in place. Well, I would say we have a fairly vigorous um, education program. I mean, um, a lot of it is focused on uh, school children, primary and secondary uh, level, but we also have adult education programs. Um, funding is, of course, um, a challenge with that, but it is, in fact, one of the easiest things to fund in Jamaica. It is very hard, for instance, to get funding for a contemporary art exhibition, but any program with children, you can get funding from, they're practically throwing it at you. So that is, um, so that, and that shows, again, how our utility is seen in, in Jamaican society. Uh, so that is definitely something we work on because uh, building a museum culture, I mean the culture where people go to the museum with the family, it has to start at that level, you know, and then you, you build it uh, up as you go along. Um, in terms of, uh, it also has a downside because I think um, increasingly our role is seen too heavily as that. You know, and um, the, we have had some issues. We mentioned earlier on uh, the problems that come with exhibiting challenging art. You know, and we do have art that is very, very provocative. So then uh, we actually have had some um, some challenges with the previous biennial, and I assume that we will have similar challenges with uh, with the present one. And the the subtext of the responses seems to be that people seem to think of us as a children's gallery. So we've had to have a whole conversation about the fact that an art museum, an art gallery is an adult space and that um, adult guidance is, um, is expected when children come. So we've now had to resort to putting a PG-16 uh, advisory on, on some of our exhibitions. I mean, that's sort of the best we can, we can do with that. We do not want to curtail uh, artists. So there is a downside to being seen in educational terms because that is then being pegged to... Uh, to being seen as a, chi a, a children's resource. Yeah. I'd say the same thing. We have quite an active educational program. Again, a lot of schools coming through. And in fact, what the project I'm fundraising for right now um, with the Kickstarter campaign on the Art Basel page is actually to create an education space because we get a lot of kids coming in a lot of schools, but we didn't have really space for them. So they're all like sitting on the steps of the gallery. and. Um, and I think it's a really crucial part of our mandate. But again, there's the, I mean, we're, we're about to open our national exhibition in four days and uh, it's all about race and identity and it's going to be quite there's some quite h tough pieces in there too so I'm sure I'll have the same similar but but I do see the space I've always told my board who are very supportive of me that I don't just see it as a sort of visual art space I want the energy to be the creative think tank with, with new ideas like how to approach society so I'm very committed to social programming again, going to the over-the-hill community, um, I think it's of, of utmost importance to um, educate, but not simply in the arts. You know, I think there's a misunderstanding that, it, or for me, what, what I want is, the misunderstanding is it's just, I want everyone to be an artist, or I want everyone to appreciate paintings. I think it's all about generating creativity, creative thinking. Uh, we hosted a TEDx talk, it was the first TED in the Bahamas, and so, in things like that, just creative thinking. And I think that's something we believe really strongly in. So we have very active panel discussions, artist talks, uh, topics about social issues um, as well. So, yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's extremely important. But again, sometimes I do also think, you know, is, that, is it actually the job of the art museum? But I'm very happy to do it, so. <laughs> 
I was wondering if um, any of the three of you have had any contact with the art space in Haiti. Uh, despite its challenges, it appears to have a, a very vibrant artistic um, heritage and, and future. Sure, um, not as much as we would like to, you know, um, but there are a number of artists and um, art professionals in Haiti that we're in regular communication with. Uh, the problem with direct exchanges between Haiti and us is that we both don't have money, you know, so unless it is mediated by another uh, channel, uh, the direct exchanges are not going to happen. Um, you know, but I think we are so close. I mean, it's a 20 minute flight, yeah. you know, and, and um, yet it seems to exist in other worlds sometimes. Uh, I would say in the 1980s, the exchanges were more active. I think there was a little bit more economic vibrancy on both sides at that, uh, at that time. Uh, but that's definitely one of the areas that we need to focus on. Because, for instance, to collaborate with Martinique or Guadeloupe is easy, because there's money there, there there's, uh, you know, to, to do that. But with Haiti, it's always the resources. There's, I've also found a lot of the, um, the Haitians, the support for Haitian art, uh, in the last two years, I think there were about three or four notable exhibitions, one at Nottingham Contemporary, for example, in the UK, focusing on Haitian art. And um, there is a sort of subset of a market for Haitian art. And for some reason, it's plucked out and treated very separately out of a, Caribbean, a broader Caribbean context. And that will have some part to do with the French colonial history, but for some reason, there's definitely a separation with how people view that work. And um, also, there are Haitian artists who are making fine art, and then you've got Haitian intuitive artists who are making, making objects or more folk art, and there's also a big discrepancy between those two. So I think that has to do with part of this separation that exists in the region. I think there's more questions here. Yes, I had two questions. One was about funding, and the other one, one was more about ideology. Like, I was wondering, you know, each institution is very differently, and I in, what, was wondering about how much percentage of the funding comes from government versus private. And then I was also intrigued by the notion that, yes, you know, the Caribbean is a very um, diverse region, and sometimes connectivity is hard. But I was wondering if you all thought, if we were at a moment in which we can start making connection, maybe not through grand narratives, but through actually moments of experience, that being, you know, identity, for example. I think in, in the islands, we've all have had a history of race, of even, you know, even the idea of the carnival, and language, too. So, yeah. Probably a good time to talk about um, math. On math, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so there's actually a show being put together right now by Claire Tonkin and Krista Thompson called On Mass, which is a show basically about how carna different sorts of carnival and festival were sort of the first performance art, and that's going to be a traveling exhibition that opens in New Orleans. And we're both hosting it. I'm hosting it in 2016. I'm not sure when you are. And um, I think there is a, a very strong movement of that. I think the movement's very personal. Uh, it's not driven by governments particularly, even though um, I work for, a, actually, I'm not a civil servant. It's a quasi-governmental institution, so I get part of my funding from the government. It's a little over half of what I need. Uh, it pretty much pays the light bill. Um, electricity in the Bahamas is outrageous. Uh, and so, um, And the rest needs to be raised privately, uh, which is very, very hard work because the Bahamas is a place where a lot of people go that don't necessarily want to be parted from their money. So, <laughs> um, so it's kind of a, a, a double, uh, yeah, I get quite, I mean, quite a generous grant from the government. I'm not complaining, but it's certainly not enough. Um, ticket sales, merchandise, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but regarding the connectivity, I think there's now a sort of movement. That Fresh Milk in Barbados, Annalie Davis started an interactive map of the Caribbean, of Caribbean art spaces, and I think it's really driven by the people. And we're, um, and I think the, the government's always very slow to react and slightly suspicious um, of if you want to start bringing in Jamaicans or Haitians, uh, in our case, in the Bahamas, because, of course, 
we think we're the best. Um, so it's very personal. So there's a lot of people, like you mentioned ARC Magazine, Holly Bino and Nadia Huggins uh, have been extraordinary in connecting the region. Um, the magazine's been really very important and uh, in connecting all of us. So I think there's... And her digital footprint, her blog her is digital, her very blogs, active. Every, yeah. Very, very active. And I think just with things like this, through the Davi Doff, through, through these conversations, um, there is a movement that we all really are pushing to involve each other more. Uh, Bahamian artists in the, Nash in the Biennale of Jamaica, that would have been unheard of five, ten years ago. And uh, I know that the former director, David Bailey, who was the interim director, he did a show with a, I believe it was a Jamaican artist, and it was almost a sort of national outcry. But I think now, if, several years later, we're all becoming much more open to the idea of, of um, exchange and sharing. So hopefully it will just continue to be positive. And really, your space is government sure. funded. Right, well, we are government. I mean, we are publicly funded, at least in theory. In practice, uh, that really means that we have a roof over our head, more or less, and um, that the salaries are paid, and that I think about half of the electricity be, uh, bill is paid, and we are just hoping and electricity praying is for, a problem for the rest. Electricity problem in the Caribbean <laughs> in general. <laughs> You know, uh, we have been living with threats of this connection once in a while, but thankfully, uh, thus far, common sense has prevailed. But all our exhibitions, acquisitions, and so on, all of that is funded off the government budget, and we just find funds, you know, uh, which could be grant money, which is our own uh, revenues. We have a gift shop, we have admissions, of course, and so forth. Um, we also do a lot with very little money. You know, I mean, some years ago, a friend who was working at the Corcoran, we were um, comparing notes about budget cuts. We had just gotten a severe budget cut, and he was whining that he had gotten a budget cut of uh, six million U.S. dollars. So I started laughing because we have never had uh, six million U.S. dollars. Uh, our, our budget is more in the vicinity of about five, five hundred to six hundred thousand U.S. Uh, per year. Uh, so just so that you can get a sense of, yeah. of scale. Yeah. You know? And Pablo? So, Beta Local, it's, it's, um, we receive no funding from the government. It's um, so, solely... Not that you would say no to it. Hmm? Not that you would say no. Yeah, that's, um, that's um, for us. You know, we, and then we go from, you know, like really small, you know, we're a really small organization, really flexible. We want to keep it, there, you know, that way. And we go from monthly events that cost $10 you know, their dinners, you know, like fundraising, small fundraising events. Then we do kind of like bigger ones. And then also we, we receive money from grants and foundations. And also we receive a lot of help from, you know, like the generosity of a lot of people. So that's something that it's, um, we can operate because of that generosity. And then also we are really, um, we're really conscious of our position and then kind of like in the context of, of Puerto Rico and then also outside of it. A lot of people try to use us as an example of an independent, private nonprofit organization, but, um, but we're always, you know, like saying that we do it because that's the only way for us to do it, but we are always pushing and kind of like demanding yeah. <laughs> that, you know, that that shouldn't be the model, you know, like government should be also flexible and also should take care of cultural initiatives. So you're doing what you can with what you have. I think there's another question. Hold it right in front of your mouth. Hold it right in front of your mouth. Hi, yes, my name is Charo Ked, and I'm the founding director of Edge Zones, which is a nonprofit organization here in Miami, and I'm Dominican. Um, Edge Zones has been around for 11 years, and we are actually, um, our model was m and projects. And we really believe not just in Miami, but in creating bridges with the Caribbean. So we do a lot for, not only through our publications, but when we've had very large spaces, we have given spaces to people from Puerto Rico, from artist groups from El Salvador, and you know, we have gone to Puerto Rico, we have gone, we, I constantly do uh, events in the Dominican Republic, where we basically taking the little funding we have and we're sharing it. You know, we are like, our budget is under $100,000 and we get mostly grants from local uh, arts councils, and we take that money and do events. We take artists from here to the Dominican Republic and bring artists from the Dominican Republic here. So we try to really create things and spaces 
platforms for the sharing. We are very interested in the rest of the Caribbean because we see the privileged position that we have here in Miami. We are able to all get together here. We're able to see and dialogue with um, the different islands. So as that, you know, we, we really believe in um, using it to create the dialogue. So I just wanted to let you know that the diaspora is very interested in continuing to create these bridges. Thank you. I want to say something. Are you next? Yes. Then, then after you. Sorry. Hello. Hi there. Um, I wanted to touch a bit on, go back to the idea of governmental support. And, you know, besides the sort of traditional operating budget uh, support that you get, are there any ways to lobby the government to support very basic logistical efforts? like? Fairly, you are talking about things as simple as bringing artworks to, through customs. I mean, something, some um, mandate on that could significantly reduce, say, an exhibition budget. Is there any way to address uh, uh, sort of deal making on that level? Sure, and in fact, we're doing that because we had one of our main problems was that we operated from a leased building. Uh, we have now been able to negotiate a pepper. It's a government-owned building. It is owned by a, a government corporation. So we now have a peppercorn rental arrangement for the next 30 years, and we can refurbish, completely redo the building, which it um, desperately needs. We hope that we can negotiate similarly with uh, the electricity company so that we can get a concessionary rate. Um, basically, the position that government sort of takes with us is we pay your salaries, you do the rest. You know, So, so basically, the, the responsibility is with us um, to, to do more. And I can fully understand that in uh, the economies of Jamaica where hospitals, schools, and so on, um, are, are really in dire need of funding, that we are not a priority to give outright. Uh, as far as customs is concerned, yes, we are in dialogue with the relevant authorities to see if we can get a special concession. We do, in fact, have a duty concession. The only thing is that the administrative side of it is a nightmare. You, know, you need to apply for each consignment separately for an exemption. It needs to be signed by the minister in person. It takes like six weeks to complete. So for, for an exhibition, that is just not a practical, if you have you know, 100 works coming from all over, that's not a practical arrangement. So we, what we need is a blanket arrangement that will cover everything. But a lot, I think a lot of progress has been made with that. But not on a broad regional scale, which I think is what um, Nicola was touching on. I've set up a program whereby I've been working with a few of the artists locally and regionally to set something just like that up, an NGO that lobbies for better cultural practice. And it's still in progress, but these are exactly the kinds of things. If there's an artist based on one island showing something, I mean, even in Miami, then they're being charged in port duty to bring it back in, which is fairly ridiculous. But there's no set uh, We need body something like the EU that. has in a way. We need sort of open borders because it is, yeah. and again, it's not only, like I always, tell people in the mainland United States or in Europe, you know, you can just throw everything in the back of a van and just drive, you know, for us, it's so much more complicated. And even so, within CARICOM, those same yeah. rules don't apply. Yeah, I mean, John Beadle was yeah. invited to the Martinique Biennale and he wanted to do a piece, which I'd done in the show in 2006, which is this beautiful sort of silk cotton tree made out of hanging machetes. It's absolutely stacked, you know, but you of can't course- ship that. You can't ship <laughs> The machetes and the yeah. weight and the, and so his whole participation in the Biennale, I mean, in the end, he participated with another piece, but, um, it was close to impossible. Hi, can I talk? Yes. My name is Alana Lackward. Hi, Berle. <laughs> I have a um, remark to make about meeting and fragmentation in spite of uh, the challenges of coloniality. Uh, the Dominican Republic inaugurated the first uh, Caribbean biennial in 1995. That's where I met Alison Thompson, Alice, uh, yeah, Alexandra Cummins. So we have been meeting there consistently, not as often as ideally would have happened, but this has been going on for a while. The Havana Biennial is another space where Caribbean artists have been consist consistently meeting, exchanging, even creating projects in situ. 
So um, the poly, uh, La Trienal Poligráfica de San Juan is also a very important space. So I wanted just to say that it's great that we have uh, private input, but we have self-generated projects of encounter in the region for quite a while, and we will continue to do so in spite of what we know is still happening. And the other thing is I want to ask you about online projects, uh, in, uh, because I'm sure uh, probably artists are, have already started in that direction in terms of exchanging with uh, other islands. Well, there are certain projects. Um, it's not like there's a, a, a web, how you say, web-based practice. But I gotta say, you know, like at one artist, Michael Linares, a couple of years ago, he was part of, he was actually on, on the first group of La Practica of this research and production program. Um, he developed a, a, a website that it's called La Sonora, which is a audio tech, exactly that's how it is, where, <laughs> where you can find, it's, it's um, for us, and kind of like because of, of, of the relationship with the states, kind of like a lot of texts are in English. And then, you know, a lot of those texts exi exist in Spanish, but they are really difficult to get. So he made, um, he started um, kind of having these albums where it was a collection of texts. There are also, you know, you, you find the PDFs and also you find the audio. You know, you can download the, the MP3s. But it's kind of like a, you know, a way of kind of like having a platform for, you know, like, like free Spanish art-related texts. So I gotta say that's kind of like the only project that I can think about, but it's not common to have web um, platforms, at least in Puerto Rico, you know, like thought as projects. The blog, the National Gallery blog is very active. I don't know if you wanna talk about that. Um, there's also Small Axe has a, a platform, yeah. Salon Essex, where they um, do some very interesting projects. But I think that's really something that we can explore a lot more, you know, because the digital world uh, has made things a lot easier, you know, also in terms of organizing exhibitions with an international component, a lot of the art is digital, so all you need to do is transfer the file, you know, uh, compared to the issues with cargo and so on that we've had to deal with in the past. So I think there are a lot of new possibilities there that we really have to, we just have to use them better, you know, that, that's really all, you know. <laughs> I don't think there was anyone else. I'm getting feedback that our time is up. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I suppose it's something about the online presence. We're trying to increase, again, because of the archipelago, how do we reach the other islands? But for example, for the NE7, which is our national exhibition, which is opening this week, we've created a whole, a whole website just for that show, which will connect to ours. But it was quite a lot of money and uh, you have to remember that most of my constituency or the people I'm trying to reach that have never been to the museum before don't have electricity. So um, that's also an issue I grapple with a lot, which is of course I understand that being in the 21st century and connecting to other countries and internationally, it's so important, but because of funding issues, you know, I also have to think about how I use that funding and should I rather use that to do something much more on the ground. and. Uh, reaching the audience that really needs to be, the local audience that really needs to be brought into the museum and, um, and educated that, you know, on, online isn't going to function, so. Okay, thank you. as a building, as a computer. So I didn't know if you guys are also doing, you know, connecting, oh, the, um, you know, mobile cell phones, things like that. Yeah, the question was about mobile. I mean, that's great. It's a well, question that, yes. for Digicel, right? Where, where are they, right? There was a project in Barbados a couple of years ago, Barbados Listening Posts, and at least it was 
somewhat related to what you're seeing. It was a, a series of projects throughout Bridgetown and environments, and you, wherever you stopped, you had a number to dial, and then, you know, you would be given all the background information and so on on the work. So things like that have been done. But beyond that, not really. I mean, in terms of building apps and so on, no. <laughs> not that yeah. I'm aware of. The <laughs> app culture is still a little slow, I find, regionally. I mean, it's not... Um, there's a lot of talk in West Africa about using mobile for banking. I think that's probably what you're referring to. For some reason, and I'm not the best person to say why, but it is not the same thing in the region. I mean, the Caribbean, the network is completely, it's, it's fantastic. Um, everyone does have a phone, so even if someone's going to ask you for a few dollars, they've got a phone on their hip. But it's used a lot for push marketing, and I guess there is, there's room to integrate cultural interaction when it comes to that. But that has not been done as yet. Have you guys done that? Not at all. We kind You're of, in the States. Yeah, but it's, um, we use it. We've been kind of like pushing more our, you know, kind of like our conversations through Facebook, right. which is something that it's huge in Puerto Rico. Everybody knows what's going on through Facebook. Right. So we kind of like try not only to advertise, you know, our events, but also kind of like provide more information and kind of like more things, you know, a little bit of content, or at least, you know, hook for more content. Yeah. Um, from there, using it. Yeah, I think most people are using Facebook blogs, that kind of model. But also we, but we, we f push a lot to have things in life. For example, we don't record our events. We don't videotape them. Sometimes we don't. We don't. Well, what about archive? Um, we're access? wrestling. You know, there's some 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 aspects related to it. But we really privilege the idea of having people in the same place. We're very lo-fi. We have a radio show. <laughs> It's very 70s. Great. But for what it's worth, I mean, visitorship to our blog is higher than, much higher yeah. than visitorship to the National Gallery itself. And even the biennial, most of the announcements were done via the blog than via Facebook. That was quite clever. So um, thank you for the panel. Um, it seems like they're, with my experience, and this is sort of strange, uh, echo, uh, my experience in the Caribbean is that in my, I guess in my res response to what you're saying today and everything you're talking about, my frustration with U.S. institutions and larger European institutions is the misappropriation of funds. And this, by sheer fact that you have so little funds, it seems like you have this amazing opportunity to um, uh, connect with the artist-run spaces. I mean, Puerto Rico is, a, is amazing. Uh, what's happening with the the galleries and the artists. I mean, some, speaking of diaspora, uh, with Roche coming back to Puerto Rico, and he's an amazing painter, but no one knows who he is. Um, uh, I just, could you speak to artists run spaces? And it seems like that's an untapped opportunity to, to really remain relevant and to, you know, if I come to visit you, Amanda, what, you know, is it, is it, something that you would promote to like see? Oh, definitely. We work really closely with a lot. In fact, before the National Art Gallery was founded in 2003, really the generator of the kind of contemporary art scene in the Bahamas was a space called Pop-Up Studios, which was founded by an artist called John Cox, who used to be my chief curator, um, who's a practicing artist. And really, uh, Pop-Up was extremely important. And, and, and then we have a lot of, not so much artist-run spaces, but there, there's a gallery. There are several that are, I'd say three or four, which for a tiny community, I mean, we're 350,000 people in the whole country, so. A um, it, it, the, the artists themselves are very active and very much something that not only helps the institution, but that we help, absolutely. Um, because that's really the, that, that's where the artists are formed and where it all comes from. We wouldn't be anything without it. I recently had a trip to the Middle East and um, yeah, at first I was sort of very jealous about all the money. You know, they had all this money and all these great institutions, but I realized it was very top down. And it was very um, not organic. And so yeah. I'm very grateful to, you know, we all struggle with the non-funding our institution. But I think throughout the Caribbean, it's extremely rich creatively. Yeah. Uh, extremely. And, and the artists are very self-organizing. And so I work very closely with the non-profit spaces. And in fact, when people do come, I give them a little itinerary and... You know, I'll drive them over to the nonprofit space yeah. or whatever, and we and we really work very much in tandem together. Um, yeah, we're getting we're getting our cutoff signs. I mean, I might you might want to mention new local space. Well, uh, there have been a small number of artist-run spaces in Jamaica. New local spaces is. is 
the presently most active one. Uh, Rock Tower recently closed, right. had a fabulous space, uh, but didn't really use it to, to the greatest potential. There have been a few other initiatives, but what we now have more is also artists forming sort of collaborative networks yeah. and doing projects on the street and so on. Uh, the Pain Jamaica project, for instance, has been that doing you. murals all over Kingston. So you see things like that, which are not based in a particular site, but which are just people organizing themselves yeah. and oftentimes they Trinidad, seem to avoid if you want to Trinidad right well Alice Trinidad Yard. Alice Yard of Alice course Yard, fresh uh, milk yeah. in Barbados yeah. I mean all throughout the Caribbean there's a lot of artist run spaces that yeah. really are absolutely generating yeah. Uh, one thing that I wanted to add, though, is that there seems to be a strong attachment to independence on the part of a lot of these artist-driven uh, projects. They do not want to be funded by foundations right. or, or any other sources. They want to be able to do what, what they want to do, you know, so uh, that's great. Puerto Rico? Yeah, we, every person that goes to the residency, we have a whole list of things, you know, not necessarily things related to the artists that we usually collaborate with, but also kind of like to have a, you know, like to you know, to show the broader picture. Right. Yeah, and then also we include on our, you know, in, in some of our mobile communication, we actually include, you know, like we advertise shows or things okay. that are happening that are not related to us. So it's in okay. a way to kind of like also push for other things. Okay. All right, great. Well, thank you. Thank you guys for coming. This has been fantastic. Thank you, Art Basel, for giving us this platform and opportunity. Um, everything is recorded and kept on the Art Basel website. So if there's anything else that anyone wasn't sure about, they can go check there. And I think as well we're going to figure out a way to pool all of the different places and spaces and faces that were mentioned and keep them all in one place. Thank you.